Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Tonight, we're excited to welcome Dr. Parag Kachalia as our speaker, as he discusses polymerization strategies to supercharge your restorative workflows. Tonight's webinar is also sponsored by 3M. At any point during the webinar, we do encourage your participation. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll answer them live at the end of the presentation. And Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. With that, I will throw it over to Dr. Kachalia. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been a, a strange 18 to 20 months now, but the upside of all this has been, we become much more comfortable with technology and platforms like this allow us to actually connect and communicate and be able to have education really at any time. And so that's fantastic that we're able to do this and Henry Shine providing this platform. My presentation today is gonna to focus around curing lights and polymerization, but not just here's a light, go buy it. That's not the point of the presentation. Rather, really what are the best practices in terms of polymerization and curing and, and what we do today? So along that mindset, we have to sit back and take a look at, you know, what are our options in practice? And we start to think about all the materials that we're using and the polymerization that's involved in it is as, simply as, is as simple as turning on a blue light and allowing that restoration to polymerize. Is that all it is or is it something much deeper? And what I hope to share the next 45 minutes to an hour is so that it's actually much more complicated. Uh, but if we have some baseline information, know what to do from a best practice standpoint, know what to do in terms of testing our lights, understand our materials, restorative dentistry can be quite, become quite predictable. Unfortunately, what happens too often is we look at other issues along the way for why a restoration may fail, right? We may say it's the adhesive issue that occurred, or maybe it's a moisture contamination issue, and maybe you know rubber dam wasn't used or something else happened, and that was the reason for failure. And while those things may be true, sometimes it may be as simple or as complicated, depending on how you will and look at it, as your curing light. And especially we start to think about placing restorations in three, four, five millimeters in depth if you're doing a bulk fill restoration or for curing a, a resin cement through a ceramic restoration, is it actually hardening? And so throughout this presentation, I'll touch on points. We'll start kind of big picture in terms of best practices when it comes to curing. And then we'll dive deeper and deeper and deeper and down to levels of you know, what adhesives, how are you using adhesives today? How are you using cements today? And how does polymerization come into effect? So to give you a little bit of background on myself, I won't spend uh, too long doing this. I practice in San Ramon, California, which is about 35 miles uh, east of San Francisco. I spent the first 17 years of my career, I've been practicing 20 years now. So practice for the first, first 17 years in a combination of on the academic side of the house at the University of Pacific, where I was vice chair of restorative dentistry. And then also in the private practice side, my wife and I have shared a practice for, for the last 20 years now. About three years ago, I left the academic world and decided to focus more on the private practice area and, and my speaking life. And uh, most recently, I took over and accepted the role of Director of Education and Industry Relations for the Seattle Study Club. And so I encourage all of you, I think you know, learning is important. So if you have a study club in your neighborhood, a little pitch for the Seattle Study Club here is, you know, consider joining us. It's, it's all about collaboration and interdisciplinary care. We would love for you to have us. But because of my affiliation with the, set, with the Seattle Study Club, as well as my prior role in academia, I do a lot of product testing. So over the years, I've tested you know, hundreds of products. And through that time, I like to share you know, kind of what's worked, what hasn't worked, and, and in my journey along the way. I've done a fair amount of research over the years. So what you'll see in my presentation today, it's really a combination of the reality of what's happening in my private practice mixed with a lot of research in terms of articles I'm reading, maybe things I've done in the past in a testing standpoint at the university, as well as a lot of product development component and looking at you know, what are the best practices of using products, but understanding how they're fabricated in the first place and then testing those products kind of within our practice. So it's really a blend of all those concepts that we'll put together. Now, we have a relatively short period of time today. I will do my best to answer as many questions as I can at the end. And remember, put those in the Q&A box and not the chat box. So if you go and put those questions, Q, uh, questions in the Q&A box, I will do my best to answer them. But if you, have a, if you have a question after the fact, so let's say, two, three, four days pass, or four months pass, or even a year passes, and something comes up, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, the best way to get a hold of me is, is through social media today. And my Instagram handle is at techdds. It's just T-E-C-H-D-D-S. 
and go ahead and click on the little airplane icon there and feel free to shoot me a message whenever something comes up. I do my best to get you answers as quickly as possible if I have those answers for you. Because I believe the better dentistry we can do is dependent upon collaboration. So the best care we can provide our patients is if we don't operate in a silo, but rather share our experience or share our thought process, share articles that we're reading, whatever it may be, and then together we can move the profession forward. And that's really my goal. So my, my Instagram page is really sharing my dental journey and what I'm doing in terms of cases I'm doing, materials I might be working with, uh, procedures I might be uh, trying out, et cetera. All that's kind of documented on my Instagram page. And again, feel free to ask questions whenever they may come up. But the focus of today's presentation is to really focus on uh, four key objectives. The first is the importance of proper polymerization. It doesn't matter. Can we just turn a blue light on, buy bacteria in life, wherever we buy it from any manufacturer, and are they all the same? Is the marketing just fluff that's out there, or is there something behind it? And the research articles that are written, are they kind of you know, sponsor research articles that really don't have a validity, or actually are they really true third-party data where reputable researchers are looking at materials that are coming about and deciding how can they be polymerized appropriately? So we'll look at that importance piece and the, the evidence behind it. Because the reality of what we do today in most practices in North America and in kind of the world today is replacing resin-based restoration. Well, that's a direct restoration or indirect restoration in terms of cementation. So if resin is there, more often than not, it must be polymerized. Now there's a chance, right? They may go through some kind of self-cure activation with some of the resins we use. But generally speaking, we're using a light cure component. And if we're, and if we're using a light cure component, we need to make sure enough light gets to the actual resin. The next concept we'll think about is adhesion. So replacing resin today, we're probably doing a lot of adhesive dentistry. And how do bonding agents play a role in that? What about dual cure versus light cure bonding agents? What's happening with compatibility with maybe a dual cure, a resin that may be going on to adhesive? Talk about that. Do different bonding agents matter? Does it, is a fourth generation better than a sixth or seventh generation or universal today? We'll discuss kind of tidbits of that. We'll look at resins in terms of bulk flow restorations and uh, do bulk flow restorations actually work? And is it just, again, is it just marketing or can we actually place restorations in four or five millimeters and achieve a predictable depth of cure? And look at the third party research behind that and systematic reviews and say, does this work or not? And then we'll finally finish with cementation. Now, obviously there's a lot of information to cover in a relatively short period of time. So I'll do my best to tackle this. We won't deep dive into any given area, but we'll get a, a general overview. And again, please feel free to, to reach out. So let's start with kind of when you get to practice every morning and you open up your drawer of restorative materials, uh, what's in there? Because years ago, what we dealt with was amalgam restorations and porcelain fused metal crowns. In those cases, light polymerization was not important at all because you were not able to transmit light through those restorations. It was almost an auto cure component, right? We know alloys set in a given period of time and we knew with a PFM restoration, we had to use a cement like a zinc phosphate or polycarboxylate cement that did not need any kind of light activation. But where's the world today? And when we look at the world today, we have many different adhesives Many of us in practice may have more than one. You might be using many different flowable composites. In the past, flowable was like the duct tape of dentistry is meant to repair things, patch provisional, be used as a liner. Today, flowables can be used as final restorations. We can do class one, two, three restorations all in flowable. You could do direct veneers all in flowable through injection molding techniques. We'll discuss some of that. So if you're using that today and you're using different flowable composites, how are they polymerizing? What about your direct resin restorations? In direct resin, there's many brands, many opacities, many different filler contents. Do each of these components change how much polymerization is needed? So we'll dive into these components and say, does it, does it make a difference, right? Do you need to apply a different polymerization strategy to each of these? Do we need to do different types of curing cycles in terms of like pulse cure, your ram cures, and all the different things that are out there? What's really most important? Is it just about power, meaning the more power your light has, the better end result you get? Or is there other factors that come into play? So as we start to look at all this, think about all the materials you have in practice and think about what was your training like in dental school? 
And if I think back to my years as a student in dental school and the, the questions that we had to answer on a test, you know, we knew that what the primary photo initiators are, we knew the wavelength, the light that needed to be used in order to initiate resin. But what was the actual training like? And what I remember as a dental student was the training for me was really put the light in place, don't look at it because it's going to hurt your eyes and try not to move it. That was kind of the training that was involved there. Now, as a faculty member, I kind of took that same training that I had, didn't really understand curing for the first, I'd say, five years of my career, the 17 years or so there, and really applied the same thing. So you really just get the light there, hold it in place, try not to look at it, and we should be good. But as I started to do more research, as we started to work in the lab, as we started doing depth of cure studies and taking resin that we thought was polymerized and sectioning it, we started to see many different results. And we started to learn how important curing was. And sometimes curing becomes almost too simplistic, even to the point where you know, major manufacturers will give you a curing light for free if you buy X amount of resin. You know, that's great, but it does a devalue in some ways what the curing light is all about and what we need to do in terms of training for it. Now, as we flash forward and in the academic world today, many institutions are truly training their students today. So I'm gonna show you an interesting graph here. So there's a company called Blue Light Analytics and Blue Light Analytics is, is really, really the founders of kind of light testing in terms of the laboratory component. So they're really the ones that created the technology to test lights in a lab. And then more recently, they've come out with some consumer-based technologies. But what they would do is they create this device that essentially put a sensor into a deniform or type it on. And then what you had to do is you took a, someone who is not trained in curing, you said, okay, go ahead. And I'm gonna give you some basic information, go ahead and cure, right? Turn the light on, put, it in, put the light in place and then turn it on and let's see what happens, okay? So the first graph here is kind of ideal, but ideally when you put a light in place on a sensor, what should happen is the line should say constant, meaning the X axis, if you look at your screen is time and the Y axis the radians. So if I put my light in place, let's say it's tooth number 30, and the sensor's on the occlusal of tooth number 30, my light should not move, it should stay in place, and my irradiance should stay exactly the same through the entire 10 second cure, right? Now, some lights do a ramp up method, but they eventually hit a point where they flatten out. That's what we wanna see. So that's what we should ideally see. But when we put the hands into lights of both students and seasoned practitioners, here's what we find. What we find is the light goes all over the place. So why is this happening? And it happens for a few reasons. So again, look at the X axis, that's 10 seconds. Look at the change in what occurs, right? And so what you have here is a given light, different practitioners using a given light. And what we start to see is this, these spikes, right? Up and down, up and down, almost like a Richter scale where you know, an earthquake's happening in some ways. And that's because the light is moving further away or going side to side and it's getting off the sensor. And I can tell you, I was just as guilty of this until I started to truly understand the importance of polymerization. Because what happens, we put the light in place and we turn our heads or look away or go to grab something from our, somewhere else in our operatory and the light starts to deviate away from the restoration. And when that happens, proper polymerization is not occurring. So if you think about a lower first molar, you do an MOD restoration, right? And we hope to be covering the entire tooth. Are you really getting the mesial, the central pit, and the distal at one time when the light's in place if things start to move? So if, whether it's you as the doctor curing or your assistant's curing, the big thing here is we want to make sure that we're trained appropriately. So as long as you're trained appropriately, we should be in good shape. So whether it's a yellow, uh, orange paddle that you're using to keep the light out of your eyes or you're kind of holding the light in place, we need to, number one, make sure the light stays in place. And then once people are trained, we see this continuous pattern. So yeah, training occurs and then light gets put into place. Now, how important is this? Well, in, 19, in, sorry, in 2002, where the data was collected in the late 1990s, in 2002, Fan and colleagues published a paper in the American Dental Association that looked at how often restorations are insufficiently cured. Now, in 2002, that rate was 37% of the time, restorations were not sufficiently cured. That's a big number. But then let's think about 2002, what happened around that time? Around that time, we started to see LED curing lights come out. 
they were just starting in the early 2000s. Now, if you think about research papers, the data has to be collected much sooner. So actually, in actuality, most of these restorations were cured with halogen curing lines. And halogen, quite frankly, is a little bit more forgiving. So they're cured with halogen, yet still having 37% insufficient cure restorations. That's a lot of potential restorations that may need to be redone. The patient may have some sensitivity. Different issues are occurring. Okay? Now, in 2015, the International Association of Dental Researchers, uh, a table clinic was presented. And at that table clinic, it was shown that 30% of lights tested delivered half the dose that was needed. So this is a major issue, right? In both studies, one third of lights are not doing what they need to do. So think about your own practice. When was the last time you tested your curing light? If so, how are you testing it? When was the last time you looked at the materials you're curing and saying, are they actually hardening or not? And do we look at the curing light as a potential issue? So what happens when things are not appropriately cured or properly cured? We think about your class two box form, right? The hardest part to cure is the depth of the box form. And the depth of the box form is not cured appropriately with that resin's place, we can get cracks and fractures. The entire box form can break off because the, the gingival form is squishy. It's not cured appropriately. You get poor cross linkage. So between the adhesive that might be at four or five millimeters in depth and the lights four to five millimeters away in the box form and we're trying to cure that and then put our resin on top and then cure that again, the two may not be merging. We may have certain resins that don't polymerize to completion and camphor quinone, the photo initiator, starts to leach back out. It's never fully initiated, starts to leach back out. And suddenly restorations that look appropriate day one are actually turning yellowish brown some months or years later. So color shifting can occur. We can get secondary caries. We know about that. We know we can get poor bond strains. So all these amazing bond strains that are reported by manufacturers say, only occur when proper polymerization is happening. But if you never polymerize appropriately, that bond strain is simply a number on a research article or in a marketing ad. It's not actually happening clinically for you. And then finally, there's leaching, of the, there's leaching into dentin and cytotoxicity. So we know dentin is a living tissue. If resin is not polymerized appropriately onto it or bonding agents not, we know nothing positive occurs and there's only negatives that can occur from this. And so if a negative is happening, you know, we need to be careful of that. So these are just six components as well as many other things that could occur. So what makes up a successful cure? And when we think about successful curing today, what we need to start to consider is there's really four factors. The first is characteristic of the restoration and the materials, right? How opaque is it? Is it a flowable? Is it a bulk flow composite? What is it, right? Is it a cement? So what are the characteristics of the materials? How is your technique? How are you or your assistant or whoever's curing your hygienist trained? What is the condition of your curing light? Right? Are the optics appropriate? Is there, is there a resin that's caked on the outside of it? Is something broken? Right? How is the battery held? And incredibly enough, the battery health is very important. And then are we delivering enough energy to the restoration at the end of the day without overheating the tube? So these four factors are critical in achieving a successful cure. Now, we don't have time to cover all these, but we will focus on two in particular. The two that we'll focus on are characteristics of the restoration of materials and then delivering enough energy to the restoration of the two primary aspects. So let's look at kind of bread and butter dentistry, what we do all day long in practice, right? But what we do all day long is incredibly challenging because in order to get success in a quadrant like this, we have an MO next to an MOD, next to a DO, right? In order to get success here, not only do we need no sensitivity for the patient and appropriate, uh, appropriate proximal contacts, appropriate proximal contacts and margin CLR seal appropriately and nice occlusion, we need restorations to last and not just be there for day one, two or three, but ideally be there seven, eight, nine, 10, 15 years down the road, assuming the patient's doing their part, right? We have to stack the deck in our favor. Now we work in a very hostile environment. If we look at that distal box from on tooth number 30, it's pretty far down there, right? So even with rubber dam isolation, we had to cut a little bit of, a little bit of way to go ahead and place our uh, matrix in place. And that gingival margin is at the depth of the tissue. So that's tricky. So not only is there a moisture, you know, potential moisture issue, we're doing our best to control this, but now we have to cure 
five to six millimeters away from where the curing light is going to bottom out on the cusp. Sometimes if you have a really angled cusp, cusp angulation, that might be seven or eight millimeters away. So to achieve a predictable bond down there is quite tricky. Right, and then what material is going to be used when we do these? So there's numerous variables that come into play. And like many of you, there's a lot of materials I use in my practice, right? So Filtex Supreme is one of the materials I've used for many years. And then I also use other materials like Harmonize. So let's take a look at Filtex Supreme Ultra. Filtex Supreme Ultra, if you look at the instructions for use and every manufacturer will do this with their resins, they will let you know for each shade and for each opacity, what the increment is in terms of maximum increment and what the appropriate curing time should be based on the output of your light, okay? So we take a look at Filtex Supreme Ultra, you look at a body shade, so body opacity, and a two millimeter increment. If your light's outputting less than a thousand milliwatts per centimeter squared, your curing time can be 20 seconds. On the other hand, if you have more powerful light, outputting a thousand plus, so one to 2000 milliwatts per centimeter squared, that curing time can be cut in half. And we can go from 20 seconds to 10 seconds. If you're using a Denton shade or a dark body shade, we wanna cut our increment in half and increase the time. So is it simple to say, well, all resins should be cured at 20 seconds for all manufacturers or 40 seconds, right? Well, let's take a look. So we look at, in this case, harmonize. We open up our instructions for use, okay? And you go, however, and you find the language that suits you. And most of us are in North America days. Let's pick up, uh, let's pick English here. And within the Optilux light, or a halogen curing light that might output 600 to 1,000 milliwatts, 20 second cure is appropriate for Denton shades up to 1.5 millimeters and enamel and translucent shades up to two. On the other hand, if you're over 1,000 watts, you can go down to 10 seconds, okay? A little bit different. So they break, there's into Denton shades and enamel shades, right? Not necessarily a body shade that's being talked about, right? Or specifying based on darker shades. So each manufacturer has this type of information. So can you just, again, cure all of them for a longer period of time? Unfortunately, the longer we cure, the more heat can be generated and heat is not necessarily a good thing, right? For the pulp. Then we also have to look at ideal curing lights. So in an ideal world, if we had a depth of our light, right? And said, okay, our light's gonna penetrate X amount of millimeters. What would ideally happen is the beam profile, so the light that comes out of our curing light, would be homogeneous, meaning everywhere around the periphery of that light up to a given depth, we would have proper polymerization occurring. There'd be enough irradiance down to a level that our restorations can be cured. So the upper left-hand side of your screen, what you see there is an ideal beam profile. So ideally, yeah, significant amount of curing. When we test curing lights, what we find is our curing lights have hot spots. So some curing lights maybe have a dot in the middle that they're curing. Others might cure on the you know, three different spots like a triangle based on where the LEDs are placed. Some may collimate to the middle but not have a great diameter and others are more homogenous. So depending on how the LEDs are set up in your curing lights today, it can drastically impact curing. So we want an ideal show on the upper left, but that doesn't always happen. And you'll see me reference a lot of articles by uh, Dr. Price of Nova Scotia. So Dr. Price and colleagues and uh, Dr. Rugerberg as well and Blue Light Analytics and some of these companies have done some amazing research in these areas. And so you'll, let, you'll see a lot of information coming from their papers. And this is an interesting one that they showed. So we start to look at here's our clinical practice. So we take that composite restoration class two we look at from the tip of the curing light down the base of the box from a six millimeters. That's how far we need to polymerize. So that initial adhesive layer, we followed by a flowable in your first layer of composite, right? We might be six millimeters away or five and a half millimeters away to be able to cure it in an ideal scenario. Now, if you think back to that graph I showed you where light can vary, it can jump off if we're not paying attention to its position, suddenly you might be 10 millimeters away. And if you're 10 millimeters away now, are you getting enough depth to the base of your box form? Right? In an ideal world, we would hope that light would be perfectly collimated so a column of energy would come out at, at an infinite depth, but that doesn't necessarily occur. Right? And what we start to see is as we move the light away from the restoration, we get a decrease in irradiance and the decrease is pretty substantial. So what may be 1400 milliwatts per centimeter squared 
at the at the glass optic of the curing light, at the base of the box room, we might be down to 400 or even less. Now, if you start to move that, that's at six millimeters. Imagine I'm going to weigh 10 millimeters. And now at 10 millimeters, you get another 10% decrease from every millimeter you move away. So you might lose another 40% of that. So suddenly you might be under 300 milliwatts per centimeter squared at the base of the box charm if our light is moving. And if we get to that level, we may not be polymerizing at all. So those are things that we need to be really, really careful for is it's important to be as close as possible and to maintain uh, proper polymerization. And I always recommend on class two restorations, not only do you cure exclusively, but that you then pivot your light and you cure from the buccal aspect as well as a powder or a lingual aspect. So you get that kind of trans-illumination curing as well. Now this concept of collumation, well, what is it? So in my hand, I have a laser pointer. If I take that laser pointer, I'm not gonna be able to really see this. If I shine it on my back wall, this laser is perfectly collumated, meaning that a column of light comes out of the laser and the diameter does not change from where it exits to where it hits a wall a few feet away. Now, ideally we wanna see that in a curing light. But curing lights, for the most part, are like flashlights. If you take a flashlight and you move away from a wall, you'll see the diameter increase, okay, which is great. But unfortunately, as diameter increases, the intensity does not stay the same. So the intensity dissipates, it goes away. So if we look at two different curing lights here. In one case, we have a larger column of light that's coming out. In the second light, you don't see quite the same depth. You see more dispersion. So some lights are more forgiving in a column and other lights have more dispersion. So again, we wanna be careful. So what do you do? How do you deliver enough energy, right? Without causing issues and how do you measure the energy that's being delivered and how are you keeping track of it? Well, a lot of us have things like this in our office. So here's an LED radiometer. In this case, it's by Kurs and Demetron. Uh, you might have some other manufacturers that have produced theirs. There's ones that have been created for halogen and other ones that have been created for LEDs. And to me, radiometers are a starting point. And I'll share with you why I think that. I think they're a starting point, but I don't think they're the end all be all. I don't think we can count on these as much as we had hoped to. And radiometers are almost consistent within themselves. So if you take one light from, if you take one radiometer and you measure a curing light on it and then take that curing light to a different radiometer, it may not measure exactly the same, okay? At the same time, different curing lights obviously have different measurements. And depending on the diameter of the sensor on the radiometer, it may not match appropriately to the curing light that you're using. So we don't always get the best information from radiometers, but they are a starting point. There's a really nice article by a group out of Brazil in 2019 that was published that looked at different types of radiometers. Uh, or different types of digital meters, I should say. The first thing they did is on the far right-hand side of the scale, they took a laboratory grade uh, spectrophotometer, okay? And they essentially said, with a laboratory grade device allowed to measure proper irradiance, what are we seeing? So that's your standard. So far right-hand side of the scale should be really what the lights are measuring. And they measured each light, okay? With two different laboratory grade instruments. Okay, so each light, if you look at Elipar or Blue Phase or Cordovelo, right? Take a look at all four curing lights here. The far right-hand side of the scale is what is accurate. That's the true number. And then the far left-hand side of the scale, they took an analog meter. Okay? And they took these analog meters out like the blue one that's pictured. So whether that's the Demotron ones or the Spring one or the Henry Schein ones that you can buy, right? They took these and said, if we take that curing light we just measured in a laboratory environment, and put it on the analog meter, what do we measure? And in pretty much every case, in every case that was measured, these analog meters tended to show a lesser output, a lesser irradiance. So the good news about that is it's underperforming, right? It's telling you there's less than you're actually getting, okay? So that's the good news about it, but it's not giving you the true number. Then they looked at the built-in meters within different curing lights. So some curing light manufacturers within the base have a built-in meter. And looked at those built-in meters and said, if we put a curing light onto a built-in meter, how does that measure? And a lot of times the like, built-in meters actually overestimated. 
Some are more accurate than others, but they tend to be a little bit of an overestimate. And that can be more concerning because if the meter is telling you that your light is performing better than it actually is, then you might not be getting the true clinical result that you need, right? So we gotta be a little bit careful. And part of the issue with this is those built-in meters don't work for all lights. The built-in meters are meant for the light that was, meant, that was developed by the manufacturer for the meter. So the diameter is different. It may not be measuring the true output. So we need to be a little bit careful here, okay? So what do these numbers mean? And is irradiance a big deal? Like, should we pay attention to this number? And again, irradiance is a starting point, but we have to understand how the data can be manipulated if we don't pay attention to it. So if we think back to our algebra classes, right? And we look at just simple fractions. Our irradiance component, right? Is a, is a equation based on power in the numerator and area in the denominator. So if I wanna increase my irradiance number, if I increase my power, irradiance number goes up, great. Okay, but it can also go up by decrease my area. So unfortunately, some of the lights that we see out there, they decrease the diameter of the light to show you a very small diameter of light. So now if you take power over a small diameter, you get a higher radiance. Great marketing, unfortunately, poor clinical outcomes. Think about that 10 to 12 millimeter lower first molar. We did an MOD restoration on it and your optic now measures five millimeters and says, hey, I have greater radiance. You now need to make sure you're curing at least twice, mesial half, distal half, if not three times to ever get the entirety of the two. So we need to take this into consideration. What we really should be looking at that's hard to measure, right, is joules. This is the true energy that's being delivered. So it's irradiance multiplied time by time. So how much joules of energy are actually being delivered to every area of the restoration that's being put in? That's a tough one to measure. So there's other best practice we can take into account. So why do we get these variations in numbers? Like what happens? Like why do different radiometers measure different things? Well, some of that's based on in the halogen world is quite simple. Light went through the halogen tip, right? It's kind of this homogenous light that came out at a and then that light that came out was be able to be measured based on the simple diameter of the glass optic. LED lights, on the other hand, are very different. LEDs, by definition, have LED light chips that are there. And because these LED lights are there, there's a pattern of light that comes out. Some mix very well, and others are a little bit different. Others don't necessarily mix all together, but the surface area of any given chip is large enough to be able to kind of uh, hit enough of the areas. There's also different photo initiators. So resins today primarily are camphoroquinone based. Camphoroquinone is a primary photo initiator. Although there's other photo initiators out there like TPO or acyl phosphine oxides that are out there. And these photo initiators are put in place. Uh, they cure with different colors of light but more of the purple spectrum. And they cure in a way, the reason they're used is because they take out some of the yellowish, yellowishness of the resins. So we need to make sure one, what are we curing? And is our light able to cure everything? So again, the halogen world, right? We have this broad wavelength. The light mixed pretty nicely through the glass tip. In the LED world, we have these peaks. So we have a single peak LED or a multi-peak LED. Both can work, but you should be aware of the type of resin you're using. And if you're using a lot of resins that have a lot of these other photo initiators, Right? It may not be a bad idea to consider a multi-peak or at least spend enough time where you're delivering enough energy to make sure you get all the camphoroquinone conversion because the vast majority of composites, the majority is still camphoroquinone driven. Okay? So here's where I have concerns. So you see a number like this, oh, 2000 milliwatts of energy of a power that's being delivered. Well, that's great. As long as the tip diameter is fairly large, it can deliver enough energy at a low heat component. So if you go to eBay on any given day of the week, you see five pack of curing lights for $100. And that concerns me. You know, I run a very tight ship in my practice. I want to make sure I control costs uh, appropriately. But I don't try to control costs where the end outcome could spell redo a restoration or potential harm to a patient. Because if you have to redo one, two, three restorations, suddenly, the amount that we think we saved on the curing light is money 
uh, that was not well spent, right? We should have maybe considered getting a, a carrying light from a top tier manufacturer that's been vetted. So you might be lucky, you might find the best light that's out there. The problem is you don't know necessarily when things are not working until a patient comes back with issues. And in the, all the Facebook groups that are online today, I see these chats all the time saying, hey, I'm so proud of this $20 carrying light I got. Well, that's great if you found that magic light that's out there. But unfortunately, a lot of these lights have issues. So be very, very careful and consider investing appropriately in your carrying light. So again, they tend to have small diameters. They tend to have a high heat. And the output stability tends to be quite poor with many of these curing lights. So what do we mean by output stability? So some of these things that we look at is we start to say, when you put the, there, most of these curing lights are battery driven. So you charge a battery on a base, right? Or you plug it, or you have a component that you plug into it that charges the battery. But when that battery goes in, what we want to have happen is the moment that battery stops, the moment the light no longer is producing enough energy, we want that battery to stop. Right? They should be in sync, meaning if the battery is about to run out, I want, to, I want to make sure that the output I'm getting of my light is the same at the very first time I use a curing light and the 50th time I use a curing light during that battery cycle charge. I don't want any drop off to occur. If drop off occurs, that tells me, yes, when I freshly charge batteries, I have great output. But what about 10, 30, 40, 50 cycles into your day? What is your light output at that point? And if you take a look at this chart, you'll see the three manufacturers, right? Um, that have very constant output. So if you look at the Demi Plus by Kerr, the LFR S10 by 3M, the Blue Face by Ivoclar, in each case, we see that perfect horizontal light, right? There's no drop off. And what you end up seeing is that at the point where the battery cycle ends, the battery is done, there's no charge left, right? It just stops you can no longer run a curing cycle versus others. So others in this chart, we started to see that, yes, they start off really great, but suddenly we are able to get 30, 40, 50, in some cases, a hundred extra cycles of, rate of, of light curing to occur where not enough energy was actually being produced. So as a battery drop-off occurred, so we take a look at the Saab 2 here, as that battery drop-off occurred, the, the light still stayed on. So you thought you were polymerizing, but unfortunately you were not, and you crossed the critical threshold. In this case, there was actually about 120 more cycles of curing that occurred uh, beyond that critical threshold, where it was no longer actually polymerizing. So be very, very careful that battery charge and stability is very, very important. And that's one of the factors that come into play. So how do you know you're delivering enough energy? Are there ways to, that are new age radiometers and things that are out there? Uh, in fact, there is. So here's what we use in our practice. That research article I showed you, right, looked at laboratory grade testing. So Blue Dye Analytics has partnered with 3M and what they've done now is they've actually created essentially an in-office spectrometer. So an in-office spectrometer allows you to be able to test your curing lights and you pair it with a smart device, you pair it with your iPhone, and it'll actually tell you how much curing time is needed for all the restorative materials in your practice. All right, so you don't have to go through the IFUs trying to figure out what you need to cure for how long at any given period of time, right? It will tell you, you log in every material that you're using, you test your curing lights, it takes 20 seconds to test your curing lights, and it will tell you what's happening. It'll give you insight on your materials, it'll give you a heat warning, and it logs all the information. So let me give you an example of what happens. So in this case, we're going to take the LFR Deep Cure S, right? We take that light. It has a 10 millimeter guide. That's a standard. You can change that, right? But 10 millimeter guide. You go ahead and say, get ready for the light. You put your light in place, and it takes 10 seconds. It's reading the light. And as it reads your light, it shows you that in this case, there's no drop off. If something happened or you saw pulsing or curing or something happened where there's a drop off, there was an issue. So for a 10 second cure, it stayed on the entire time, right? And then when it ended, are okay. And then it told me there's a heat issue at 14 seconds. But what it also tells me is for all these different materials that are being used in our practice, it tells you how long we need to cure. So what we see is a potential heat concern at 14 seconds. The average radiance is 1277, right? The standard radiance level is 1470, and it gives you the date that was done. So as you test your lights, ideally on a daily, if not weekly basis, 
what you start to do is you start to be able to see how each light is performing at each operatory. You actually label it, lights one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever it is, you can add some notes in place. So now all of us use maybe materials from many manufacturers. We might have multiple curing lights in our office, right? So you start to test every one and I'll tell you each one. So in one case with the LPAR, it might be full tech, might take 10 seconds to cure, but in, with Velo Grand, it might take 20 seconds to cure, right? Because the output's slightly different. Okay, Filtech flow was 20 seconds with the LPAR, and the flow was 40 seconds with the Velo. Okay, both excellent lights. They're always rated in the, the highest lights that are out there, different curing parameters between these, just on where the light's outputting. Or let's say you're using Octobon XTR bonding agent. Okay, now what does that say? Well, in that case, it needs a 10 second cure, right? Or maybe you're using Scotch Bond Universal, that also needs a 10 second cure. Now, this is us logging all the different materials we use in our practice. Very simple to do. There's a database that's built into the system and is giving us all this information. Right? So we're, we're down to the shade that we're using, right? And you kind of get into ranges, right? That we're using and types of opacities, materials, et cetera. It's all very, very focused. So if we think about the best practice of curing we just discussed and apply that to everything we're going to do at this point, what other steps can we, make, can we take to make our adhesive dentistry predictable? So let's look at our class two restoration, that number 30 restoration or preparation I showed you earlier. Well, depth of dentin is important, right? Enamel versus dentin is important when it comes to adhesion. We know the deeper the dentin we have, the worse bond strength we get. The shallower dentin we have, the better bond strength we get. We know enamel is more forgiving, dentin is not as forgiving with adhesives. So all these things need to be taken into account when we think about the adhesives we use. And I'm a strong believer in that. I tend to be not very dogmatic in a lot of things. So it's not about what you should use, right? So you're not saying go use this brand, but knowing what you use and the best practices for how you use what you use. And I humbly believe that all top tier adhesives work, but the directions vary greatly. And what I would advocate is I'm not one to change bonding agent right away. Right? I want to see good data come out before I decide to change something, or I want to have, you know, if I'm having clinical success. I'm not wanting to just go buy what's on sale this month, because if I apply the directions from bonding agent one, I'd be very comfortable with, to bonding agent two, it may be completely different. And now I may start to have failures or sensitivity or issues occur. So we look really big picture. We have to start to think, well, what are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with enamel, we're dealing with dentin. And enamel and dentin, again, are quite different. On the enamel side, it's all hydroxyapatite essentially. On the dentin side, we have a hydroxyapatite collagen and water. So in the total etched world, we're highly dependent upon that collagen layer in dentin. We need to be able to penetrate into the collagen layer and form a hybrid layer. With enamel, we need to be able to etch enamel appropriately to get a good bond to it. And while some self etchers show reasonable results on unetched enamel, I would highly, highly advocate to always etch enamel. Now, when it comes to dentin, these are the three pictures I want you to have in your head. When we prep a tooth, that tooth in the dentinal tubules in the collagen layer is covered by a smear layer. Once you etch the smear layer and you remove it, or if you etch it and remove it, you expose the collagen. And when the collagen is nice and moist and fluffy, it looks like the middle picture. When it dries out, if we over dry it, if we blow too much air onto it, that collagen collapses and becomes flat like an ice skating ring. And when it becomes flat, we get poor dentin bond strains, high sensitivity. When it's fluffy, high dentin bond strains, low chance of sensitivity. That's in the total etch world. In the self etch world, we're using an acidic primer that we're removing. We're not really removing the smear letter, but kind of rubbing some of it off and penetrating through it. It's a little bit different. So let's go through these generations from a high level to understand it. So when we start to look at these high level adhesion components, we understand that we etch the tooth in the fourth generation. We rinse it off. You may have even got a bone dry back in the fourth generation days. Your collagen collapse, you remove the smear layer, collagen collapse, you dry too much. You painted a hydrophilic primer on, you made it fluffy. When you did that, you then introduced your adhesive, right? And went ahead and cured your adhesive, you air thinned it, cured it, you put your resin in place, and air thinning is not quite as important. Uh, with four generations of how they are in some other, in other generations. But you thinned it out just so it wasn't too thick. You put your resin in place, you cured that. 
and you had a very high bond, really low sensitivity. We didn't have many sensitivity issues here. And this works really well. The beauty of this generation is they're compatible with all dual cure resins, right? Because of the two bottle system. So most two bottle systems are compatible with all dual cures. Some one bottle systems are not, although it's becoming more forgiving today. Okay? So things like Octobon FL, All Bond 2, Adverse Scotch Bond Multipurpose, right? These are all the gold standards of adhesion and many studies still compare back to this. And if you're using this, they work fantastically well. I really wouldn't sway you from it. I would just be careful with indirect dentistry as the film thickness can be a little high, but these work really well. But what happened from that fourth generation to fifth generation was we took away, we combined kind of both bottles, we made the adhesive in the primer component uh, all in one bottle, okay? And we added the etch into it. You go a generation after that, we get sixth generation adhesives. And that's the next segment we'll talk about. Because fourth generation and sixth generation are kind of the gold standards today, but we're getting a lot of good results out of some of the universes that we're seeing today. So in the sixth generation world, we take an acidic primer as a bottle number one, and we take an adhesive as bottle number two. Again, adhesive and primer are separate. The primers become acidic. We don't etch dentin, we only etch enamel, okay? It would be recommended to etch enamel, so we're doing a selective etch technique. Because we're not etching dentin, we're using a hydrophilic acidic primer, we have to scrub it fairly aggressively, so we penetrate through the smear layer and start to form a bond right, with our, through our collagen. So it's bond within our smear layer and through our collagen, we apply our adhesive. That's a hydrophilic primer, hydrophobic adhesive. We cure our adhesive, cure our resin, we get a nice result. And here's some examples in that category. Okay. Again, these work well. And then finally, what we look at is the generation that many of us are hearing about today, and really the last five to seven years of the universal world has come about. And what's happened in the universal world today is that we have kind of an etch, a primer, and an adhesive that have all been kind of put together, really, is what's happening. They've kind of been put together, right? And in some cases, some will advocate you can mix that with other primers as well, but these have all been put together into one bottle. And then we go ahead and cure, we apply it, scrub it in place, apply it, air thin it, and then cure it. Again, recommending you etch the enamel first, not necessarily etching the dentin, although you can etch the dentin if you want to. So in the universal category, here are some of the big players, uh, ESV Scotch Bond Universal by 3M, Octobon Universal by Kerr, Biscoe's All Bond Universal, and Future Bond U. The most amount of research we have today within the universal category by far is Scotch Bond Universal. There's a lot of data that's there today. And what we see is it's been working quite well over the last five years. We really have five-year data today. We only have a 10-year study yet, but five-year data looks quite favorable. And these universal adhesives tend to be forgiving to technique. I mean, you use a selective etch technique, a total etch technique, uh, or, in a, or a self pure self-etch. Pure self-etch, again, if it's all dense and okay, but if you're enamel, I recommend etching it. But what's happened most recently is kind of the next generation of universal adhesives. And the next generation of universal adhesives, Scotch Bond Universal Plus has come out. And what they've done is they've taken the technology of Scotch Bond Universal and modified some aspects to get some improvement. One aspect that's been modified is a radio opacity. So because there's a film thickness to all adhesives, we don't want our class two restorations to ever look like there's class two recurrent carries, right? And, and inappropriately redo a restoration. So a new, the new version of Scotch Bond has a higher radio opacity compared to that left half the image to right half the image. There's a bond that carries being formed now. So in many techniques today, we do a selective removal of carries for a top of the pulp. We tend not to remove it and invite the pulp if the tooth is asymptomatic. So the newest edition of Scotch Bond Universal shows that adhesion actually occurring to carries. And there's a bond occurring to ceramics because there's an MDP-based primer that's built into it. Okay. Now, the bond to glass-based ceramics has improved. I still like to put on a separate side and we'll get to that shortly. But we start to look at the radio opacity piece. You start to see amongst different adhesives, if the film thickness was a little thick, right? Adhesives generally will look radiolucent. And we're starting to get to the point now where the radio opacity is, radio opacity is improved. So it actually looks like a perfectly sealed restoration. 
and no reason to remove it, assuming there's no other issues, right? Uh, it's in place, it's asymptomatic, leave it alone. We look at our bond to carries. The bond to carries is, well, you know, there's the latest uh, the paper that came out from the American Anatomic Association has now said you should really remove all carries as the position paper that they stated. But a lot of us have been comfortable if the tooth is asymptomatic and you can create a nice peripheral seal to leave a little bit of carries in place of a means pole violation. So now if I can get a bond to that, wouldn't that be better? And what we're starting to show with Scotch Bond Universal Plus is that adhesion is actually occurring to the carious dentin. So again, when needed, there's a benefit that's occurring there. So in the adhesion category, we're seeing some advancement. Then we look at the flowable category. And as I stated in the beginning of our presentation, flowable was looked at like the duct tape of dentistry in the past. And in 1998, as flowable started to come out, it was really looking at, don't use it as a final restoration, you know, look at as a liner, look at some basic things you do with it, but don't consider a final restoration. Well, in today's world, flowable is already different. And when people ask me what flowable I use, I say, well, what indication are you looking for? Because it depends on the indication. If my indication is a shapeable flowable composite, I wanna do like an injection molding technique, I might use genial universal injectable. If I have a patient with a high carries rate, uh, show foods a beautiful flow composite with their six Ions have shown less plaque retention. So someone with high carries, I might use like a, a beautiful flow plus because there's a little bit less plaque retention. They had a 13 year study out of Florida showing this. But when high wear resistance and polishability, I might use full tech supreme flowable. If I want to have a bulk fill flowable today with high radio opacity, I'm going to use tetric evo flow by Avaclar. So it all depends on the indication. But for each of these indications, I need to know curing components again. I need to know the maximum thickness I can place with them. I need to know the rheological properties in terms of how I can move those resins around, how they work in my hands, right? The polishability, et cetera. What is the indication in place? If I'm repairing a provisional, honestly, I don't use any of these. I find the, the, the home brand or catalog brand resin composite that's the cheapest in the catalog that I can use to prepare provisional restoration. These are highly engineered materials. I don't feel they need to be used to repair a provisional. On the other hand, if I want a final restoration, the type of flow by use makes a big difference. So here's an injection case. So in this case, the patient presented, right, with the upper left image that you see there, had peg laterals, came out of ortho, a little chip on you know, number 23. And we decided we're gonna do an injection flowable technique here. We did a digital wax up, on this patient, I create a silicone index on my digital, on the, on the printed models. We use sprint ray printers, a printed by model. Went ahead and did a silicone index on it and injected flowable composite through the silicone index to build out number seven and 10. Now, you can use many different flowables there. We use, a, we, in this case, we use Genial Universal Injectable. And we built two la peg laterals very, very quickly through injection molding technique. Again, no layering here, no cutback, just a little disking of the, the uh, mesofacial line angles to be at a nice thickness. Inject a composite and then cure through the silicone index. Remove the silicone index, cure it again. Well, here's a bulk fill composite, right? Here's an old, these are old bulk fills from the first bulk fills. Uh, I was thinking about placing, right? This is before bulk fill came out. I had to make a decision. Say, how would I treat these restorations? So in this case, I recommend this to the patient they need two onlays. The patient said they couldn't afford to do two onlays. You know, back in like 2008 is when they were first economic downturn. They said they couldn't afford to do it. I had to end up doing direct composites and placing direct composites took a long time. So I started to look very closely at bulk fill composites and say, can I do a bulk fill instead? Okay, at that time I placed direct, looked at bulk fills, but was unsure of it because Everything I was ever taught in dental school was I had to layer a composite two millimeters at a time. And if I did that, I get success. And if I did oblique layers, that was really the gold standard. But then over the last 10 years, we've seen numerous papers come out time and time again that bulk fills tend to be working quite well. You know, I, do I think they're the magic bullet and should replace all direct layered resin, resin restorations? Absolutely not. But I think there's a place for them if used cautiously and appropriately and you read the directions and understanding them. So we look at uh, Olofsson and colleagues and the, the colleagues at the University of North Carolina in the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry in 2018, they published this paper looking at strain values. 
And if an MOD restoration of bicuspid is restored, how much shrinkage is occurring, how much strain is being put on the cusp uh, when the restoration gets put in place. And what was really interesting, what they found was, if you take fill tech supreme ultra and do gold standard technique of incremental fill, right? That's exactly how we should place a resin, is what we've been taught. The combined strain was 723. That's the far right hand side of the scale. Then you look at all the bulk fills. Okay, so bulk fill is one increment or a bulk fill flowable plus a layering composite on top. When Tetric Evo stand bulk fill was placed, the strain went down to 604. So it went from 723, Tetric Evo strand in four millimeters down to 604. When a sonic fill was placed, Kirsch product went down to 519. When we took Surefill SDR flow, placed a bulk fill flowable at four millimeters or so with a capping composite Filtex Supreme on top. We had our lowest strain at 497. However, if you took a material that's not meant to be bulk, bulk fill, not meant to be put in bulk, so take full tech Supreme Ultra and is placed in bulk rather than incrementally filled, the strain jumps up to 929. So the take home message here is bulk fills are showing promise. They show to be working in the right situations. At the same time, that means you should only use the materials that intend to be bulk filled. Right? Not materials are not intended to be, but you need to make sure your curing light works appropriately. So we take this restoration. Here's a, a DO restoration that we're going to go ahead and uh, restore here, form of amalgam removed, and replace a single increment bulk fill with a flowable liner. So I will put a little bit of flowable liner first. I just feel comfortable doing that. We put our adhesive in place. Our adhesive goes in. We then go ahead and put one, one flowable layer, about a half a millimeter. I go ahead and cure that. I paste my bulk fill flowable layer on top. I got a little overzealous with sanding, had to pull some of that away, right? For my single increment of bulk fill, in this case, Filtech one cured it from 10 seconds from the occlusal table, 10 from the buckle, 10 from the palatal, right? And suddenly we get a single bulk fill restoration in our time in place that drops substantially. Well, what does the data show, right? So we have to look at data, I'm very data driven. And when we look at the data components here, right, data shows is that in systematic reviews, okay, in, in highly reputable journals like dental materials, right, we're starting to see the laboratory studies show similar or better performance of bulk filled materials compared to traditional composite resins in terms of polymerization, stress, cuspal deflection, marginal gap, degree of conversion, flexural strength, and fracture strength, right? So we're seeing a lot of promise here. I'm not saying go out and just use them everywhere. I'm saying if you're using them or using them cautiously and appropriately, we're seeing some nice results. Our oldest bulk fills in practice now are 10 years old, and we're not seeing any clinical differences today. Does that mean I don't layer composite? Not at all. I still layer a lot of composite, but when needed, I do place bulk fill. Okay. How about cementation? So we'll wrap up with a few minutes in cementation. I'll go a little bit over in time, but I'll promise I'll stay on to answer questions. So we look at the cementation piece today. Cementation has become confusing, right? And this may be what your drawer of cements looks like. You have all these different cements and you're a little confused because all the syringes look the same. And a common question, if I ask somebody, you know, well, what cement do you use? A lot of practitioners say, I use Rely-X. I go, that's great. Which Rely-X do, do you use? Do you use the RMGI, the self-adhesive, or the adhesive resin cement? Which one is it? And the practitioner will say, well, I don't know, I use the yellow one or the green one or the pink one, right? Well, each one's very different. The casing or the container it comes in may be similar, but the cement itself is actually quite different, okay? So let's break things into four categories. We have our RMGI, our resin modified glass ionomers. So if you have plenty of retention, zirconia restoration, I think it's a great place to be. Then we have our self-adhesive resin cements. I need some more retention. I wanna be fairly easy to use, at the same time, I don't need to put a bonding agent on. I'm not trying to fully bond the tooth, but get a reasonable bond. That's your self-adhesive resin cement. Then you have your adhesive resin cements. Your adhesive resin cements are your maximum bond, where an adhesive must be placed onto the preparation. And some kind of a, a zirconia primer and or a cyan agent in a, a glass ceramic crown should be utilized as well. So in the self-adhesive category, I think this is the workhorse category today. And these work quite well. So for zirconia restoration, I think they work very well. For Emax 
restorations that are full crowns. I think they can work well if you're over 1.5 millimeters in thickness. I personally like to bond all my Emacs in, but zirconia-based restorations, this is kind of the world that we're operating in today if I don't need additional retention that I'm trying to get because of a short prep. Now, if I do have a short prep, things change, right? At the same time, there's many restorations in the partial coverage world, we just bond in today. So this is a typical on-lay prep of mine today. I use this Oculus Shaper Burr, looks like a bowling pin, it goes across the occlusal table, is what I utilize. I keep my margins high and dry to maintain a nice enamel rim. I try to keep my preps above the height of contour today for multiple reasons, right? There's a nice healthy band of enamel. As we go deeper gingivally and axially, we lose that enamel support. I get a better bond that way as well. A natural kind of reinforcement to the tooth. I also try to take my box forms. I try not to get overly deep if I don't need to. In some cases, I might do what's called a margin elevation strategy. I put resin in first in the box forms to lift my margin up so I get a more predictable depth of cure, right? But in any case, I want to bond these restorations in. So if I'm going to bond it in as a glass base and it's less than two millimeters, I can cure through it, okay, if I need to. But if it's more than two millimeters, my curing polymerization components are not as great. So then I offer a dual cure resin cement. So I, add, so I use both the, the light curing aspect to get as much energy as I can, but I count the resin to convert as well. Now zirconia does not transmit light well at all. And because zirconia does not transmit light well, I would advocate always using a dual cure cement with zirconia. If I'm under two millimeters, I use a light cure cement with glass ceramics, I can predictably get light to those areas. Now, what's come out in the kind of latest advancements is newest cement combination with 3M's new bonding agent. So if we think about the green labeled Reliax Ultimate and the yellow labeled Reliax Unisem 2, what 3M has done most recently is they said, we know you like to bond your restorations at times completely, and other times you just want more a bond than glass ionomer, but you don't need the full belt and suspenders approach. So can we make a cement that's flexible for you and decrease waste at the same time? So what they've recently done is they've kind of taken these two technologies and create a resin cement called Reliax Universal paired with Scotch Bond Universal Plus. So I can use Reliax Universal purely as Reliax Unisum 2 as self-adhesive, and I can do that without using a bonding agent or I can use it with a bonding agent and get full bonding capacity. So it's one cement that's flexible with the bonding agent. So depending on if you have maximum adhesion, use it with a bonding agent. If you don't need maximum adhesion, you go ahead and use it by itself. So there's a clinical case. So clinical case is zirconia restoration. If I think about normal fixed pros components, I want my axial wall height to be four millimeters so I'm gonna elude it. In this case, it's a reduced second molar crown, tight occlusion. I'm less than three millimeters in some areas. I need more retention. Because I need more retention, my process now is gonna be go ahead and get isolation. In this case, we use an ice light, put that in place. I coat my restoration with adhesive, an adhesive. You might wanna air braid first, but you coat with your adhesive. I air thin it. I don't need to cure it, although I can, but it can work in a dark cure stage. I go ahead and load my restoration with Reliax Universal Cement, place that in my restoration, seed it, go ahead and tack cure, clean up my excess. I'll still hit it with a light because the data shows, even with zirconia, if we hit a light, we're better off. So I still hit it with the light as a final cure, get as much light there as possible. I now took my flexible bonding agent resin combination to get a bond to restoration. Because I use a bonding agent inside my restoration without curing it, there's an MDP-based primer, so it acts as a zirconia primer. So what we talked about is from the benefits of universal cements is flexibility, a lot less waste if you look at the tip. There's high radio opacities today in both the bonding agent as well as the cement. There's simplicity, and there's a safety in the curing standpoint, right? Because we can cure it both in the presence of a, you, you can cure it, the cement polymerizes both in the presence of adhesive that's cured or uncured, right? So there's a little bit of safety net. So we think about everything we've talked about in the hour or so that we've been together, there's a lot that we've gone through. But the big take home message is in all the procedures that we do today, 50% of our revenue is really dependent upon a curing life. 
So going back to the very beginning, what are you doing to making sure your lights are working appropriately, right? That the optics are appropriate, the depth of cure is appropriate, that's functioning in terms of battery life. Because 50% of revenue today is dependent on proper curing. The next is create a testing protocol. So even if that's with a traditional analog radiometer, I think that's a starting point, create some kind of testing protocol and log for your practice, for your testing lights, ideally at least weekly, right? So do that. And then understand the materials you're using. And if you understand the materials you're using, you may know when you need more curing or when you may not need it. So if you feel like you need to cure more and your light puts out a lot of heat, one simple recommendation is to pull up, blow air, have your assistant blow air on the tooth as you're curing and we see a temperature drop occurring. So I understand there's a lot that we've covered. I'll stick around for a few questions, uh, but I wanna leave you with this quote before we sign off with the questions. Uh, John Wooden, as you know, is probably one of the uh, most recognized coaches in history at, UC, he was at UCLA. And what John Wooden said, a very profound quote, he said, if you don't have the time to do it right, when will you have the time to do it over? And that's kind of how I run my practice. Yes, some things may seem like they take longer on the front end, but if I don't have to redo something and it saves me time on the back end, I'm a much happier person. If nothing else, because of patient retention. Right? So things like that become very important uh, to our practice. So let me take a look at the questions here. Okay. So the, one of the questions was uh, the blue light analytics component, you know, what, like, kind of what is it, what's it called? So blue light analytics has created an app, right? Uh, has, created a, has created a device that, uh, that goes ahead and measures your curing component. It's a, la it's a laboratory technology that's been modified to bring in into the office-based component. So I'll just go back really quickly to kind of show that slide here. So you see a picture of it. If you want to be able to see it here, let me just go flip to it one second. Okay. So it's called the checkup system, and this is what it's doing, right? It's going to measure that. So that's what's there. Question is thoughts on bioactive restorative materials. Uh, can you tack them? So bioactive to me is a loaded marketing piece, right? It's a loaded marketing piece that's out there. I don't know of any real materials that have shown true bioactivity in third-party research over a significant period of time. And so do I think there's any downside to them? No. But if you go to PubMed and you actually look for third-party data that's not published in a random journal that's sponsored by a manufacturer, quite frankly, what you're gonna find is there's not a lot of great data on bioactivity. Uh, do I think there's a potential there? Sure. Um, but a lot of these materials, uh, their curing properties are a bit different. There are a lot of self-cure potential components. And so I think there's not necessarily a downside. I don't think necessarily get the upside. Uh, but if we look at true initial bioactivity, uh, RMGI, glass ionomers, really had bioactivity. So I think that was kind of a starting point in terms of bioactive. So can you tack cure and then add 40 seconds of curing? Absolutely. Uh, I tack cure quite often for cleanup, and then I go ahead and then cure uh, from that point there. Okay. Uh, the radio uh, radiometer piece, again, you can have built-in radiometers that are within your curing light itself. I think that's a starting point. We can also have radiometers that are uh, standalone that are available through distribution, like uh, you're from Henry Schein, et cetera. And then finally, you have things like the checkup system. It's the only one that's kind of out there. So all those things are options today. When it comes to things like Z prime, question was asked on zirconia bonding, is it a necessity? So I'll kind of give you the two aspects of it. I mentioned I taught the University of Pacific for 17 years. We cemented thousands of restorations with Reliax Unisem, the yellow Reliax Unisem, with zero zirconia primer use over a 10 year period of time. The number of D bonds we had were very, very low over that 10 years that we use that material. So is it a published study? No. Is Z prime a necessity or zirconia primers in general? I think they're a nice add on for non retentive preparations. But Cranenbridge principles hold. If you have four millimeters axial wall height, you can cement with anything, right? And so from that standpoint, I think primers are really, really nice to have. I don't think they're a must unless you don't have proper taper okay, and proper retention form. So from lights, we have three lights in our practice that we're, that we're using today. And you know, over the years, I've used lights from Curd, 3M, Ivacar, and Ultradent. So those are the four manufacturers of curing lights that we've used. I think they're all excellent. 
I pick all my lights based on the data of third party. Uh, ADA did a great study many years ago, and those are the four manufacturers that were really well lights. Okay. Uh, so I mentioned not needing a cured heso and bonding as your country crown. Does that refer only to 3Ms universal? So great question. So do you need to cure the adhesive in terms of resin at all times? The answer is manufacturer dependent. Okay, so it's 100% manufacturer dependent. So the reason with 3M's product, we can get away with not curing the adhesive is within the resin cement itself, there's a catalyst that drives the adhesive reaction. So if you don't merge those two systems together, you may not get adequate bond. Okay? So as a general rule, stick within your manufacturer's recommendations. The question was asked of Abisco All Bond specifically. Abisco All Bond Universal, nice bonding agent. You do need to cure that. So that bonding agent should be cured prior to cementing. Uh, question is there, what about the new pink light that's out there? Uh, I've seen it, I haven't used it. So I've seen the light, haven't used the light. A uh, light similar like bonding agents is it's something I don't switch very often. I wanna see really good third-party data. So uh, if something looks nice, that's great. Uh, at the same time, it needs to work in my hands. So I tend to stick with the companies that historically have had really nice screen lights. What do I bond veneers with? Uh, most of my uh, veneers are bonded with Verilink Aesthetic as where the vast majority of my veneers are bonded with. I, I will use other cements at times. Sometimes I'll just use composite. If I'm trying to get a specific shade. I'll use heated composite. But I'll be very careful with that at times. But for the most part, I do use Verilink Aesthetic too. Uh, for most of my veneers. And then finally, um, do I place shore fill uh, for my first layer? I've used quite a bit of shore fill, SDR, uh, SDR universal shore fill in the past. I don't use as much today, but the early generation, uh, it was great. A really nice material, has high radio opacity. I think it's totally reasonable to place it at in the first couple millimeters up to four millimeters if you want to. Uh, the data looks good on it. So I have no concerns uh, in that standpoint. I believe we are in good shape. That was the last question that I had on my end. Let me just make sure there yep, was- no I think there's actually one more in the chat. Um, what was the bowling pin burr okay, that you so, use? So the bowling, the, bowling burr, uh, the bowling pin burr I use, is a, it's a burr by Comet actually. And so other manufacturers may make something similar. I haven't seen it by anybody else. So I, I'd use a Comet version of that. It, it's called the Oclu Shaper. I don't know the specific burr number four. It's called the Oclu Shaper burr. And what that does is it creates a nice concavity in the middle of the preparation because we tend to be under-reduced in the central groove and then a rounded topography as you go out to the buccal lingual surfaces. So that is what I use for my onlay preparations uh, quite a bit. And I believe that was it. I'm looking through the chat. I don't see anything else. No, I think you're good. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. I do apologize. I did go a little bit over time today. I wish everybody the best of health. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions for me. Uh, my Instagram handle at techdds. Uh, best of health to you and your families and hope to meet in the future. Take care. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kachalia, for the excellent presentation. And thank you to 3M for sponsoring tonight's webinar. We did record the webinar, so we'll shoot that out to everyone within one week of today. And like you said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to him via Instagram, or you can email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we'll route your question to Dr. Kachalia. That is it for us tonight. So thank you so much for attending and have a great night, everyone.